And so tonight, we have two longtime club members, uh, Bob and Denny uh, Arsadi, and they're going to be giving a, a program on a trip that they simply adored. In fact, they entitled it the destination we didn't know we would love, Costa Rica. And uh, as you may have read in the uh, description of the program, Costa Rica is a very small country, smaller than the state of West Virginia. Yet it has 12 distinct ecosystems, which is home to nearly half a million species. It's an amazing place. And tonight, we're traveling to Costa Rica with Bob and Debbie. So welcome. Thank you. Tonight, we invite you to join us as we relive this journey through Costa Rica. As Rich said, it's a destination that we didn't know we were going to love. We think it was fun, but it was really wonderful. So we're excited to show you some of our, the natural wonders that we saw on our Road Scholar adventure. We often talk about our travels with Road Scholar. What we enjoy the most about it are the educational programs that they have. They bring in local guides and experts, and in this case, birders to open our eyes and expand our knowledge. So Bob and I had a casual appreciation for nature before this, but this 12-day journey in Costa Rica woke our international naturalist and sparked our interest in birding. Pura Vida. We wish you a pure, simple, good life. In Costa Rica, you'll hear the greeting as much as you'll hear hello. It's become the national motto of a country that's found harmony in a, as a way of life and in its environment. Now these are our <laughs> souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a sloth who is now a national symbol of uh, Costa Rica, and it says, live slow. <laughs> that's their motto, that's, that's how they work. And if I lumber like this lovely sea creature, you can put me to sleep. <laughs> So, green quickly, just a little bit of background on Costa Rica. You've heard some of it. Its population is only about 5 million. It's about the size of West Virginia, 20,000 square miles. It's only 10 degrees north of the equator. It's extremely rainy. They get between 8 feet and 25 feet is their average rainfall, depending on where in the country they're at. It's also warm. It's between 75 and 90 degrees is their average temperature year-round. Uh, it's elevation. It starts at sea level because on one side is the Caribbean Sea and on the other side is the Pacific Ocean. And it's really only about 100 miles as the crow flies from one to another. So it's a very short distance between two huge bodies of water. But right in between, they have a mountain range called the Talamanca Range, which is 12,500 feet high. So you got sea level all the way up to the mountains in a very short period of distance. Well. Did you know that Costa Rica has been designated one of the world's five blue zones? There are places where people live longer and healthier lives than anyone else on the planet. So go Costa Rica. Costa Rica is very proud of their sustainability. Their one goal they just achieved in 2020 is that 100% of its electricity are all from renewables. Mainly hydro, so they have, as you heard, they have a lot of rainfall. Lots of rivers, lots of waterfalls, but they also have geothermal, wind, solar, and biomass. So an extremely sustainable type of country. Well, Costa Rica actually has created policies and laws to ensure the biodiversity and sustainability. For example, the country has a massive tree planting program converting strip lands into forests to lower the, carbon, the country's carbon footprint and to mitigate climate change. So we know it's situated between the North and South American continents. So Costa Rica has served, has served for a bridge for countless species of plants and animals for thousands of years. So Costa Rica is one of the most biodiverse countries in the, on Earth. It has over half a million species. It has 6% of the world's biodiversity, but only 0.03% of its surface. Over 25% of its land is dedicated to national parks and reserves and 75% of the land is covered in forest. Now, there's a story here. Back in the 40s and before the 40s, there was 75% of the land was forested. But after that, after World War II, a lot of commerce came into Costa Rica. People with big farms, big livestock, a lot of Americans went there, a lot of people in South America. They established a lot of these big acres, and when they did, they cut down a bunch of the trees. So 
So in the early 80s, it was down to 33% forested. That's how much of the wood they lost. But at that point, the government decided, we're going to reverse our deforestation in the mid 80s, and now they're back up to 75%. And one of the main reasons was they wanted to be sustainable, but they also wanted to drive an eco tourism business. So, according to the Costa Rican embassy, Costa Rica is the birthplace of eco tourism. It's often cited as the model for conservation in harmony with community development and economic growth. It has over 1.7 million tourists per year generating about $1.7 million, which is about 8% of their GDP. That's a huge number. 80% of all visitors come to Costa Rica for ecotourism. So let's show you a map of Costa Rica and what we did there. This is a map that we have. We landed in the capital of San Jose, right here. That's the big, biggest city in the capital of Costa Rica. We spent a couple of days there doing some art museums and government buildings and things like that. And then we left and went to see nature. So we left Costa Rica, and we first went out to Tortuguero, which is on the Caribbean Sea. Now, we couldn't go there all the way. We had to stop at a place called La Pavona, because there were no more roads. That's where the roads stopped. So you have to get in the boat for about a 40-minute boat ride to get out to the coast. So you go up that river and out to Tortuguero. So we spent a couple days there, and we'll talk about that. From there, we took, a boat, we took our boat back out, took the bus ride over to a place called Sarapiki. This is the lowland tropical rainforest. And we're right on the Sarapiki River. Again, we spent another couple days here, two, three days. And then we left and went west some more to Aranal. And this is where their active volcano, Mount Aranal, is at. This has erupted in a long time, but it's still considered an active volcano. And we'll show you some pictures of that. It's a really nice looking volcano. We then went down south, and we hit, first we hit the Tacolas River which is right around here, and we had a, an amazing boat ride on the Tacolas River, and I'll, we'll show you some slides of that. Continued down and went to stay on the beach on the Pacific Ocean in a place called Punta Leon, right on the beach facing the Pacific. So we were at the Caribbean, and a few days later we were at the Pacific. While we were there, we also visited another national park called Carrera National Park. Again, a couple of days there, and then we went south to a little place along the, along the ocean right here on the beach called Hacienda Baru. We'll talk a little bit about that. That's kind of a special place. It's a preserve. We only stopped for lunch and spent a couple hours visiting the preserve. And from there, we headed inland to the highlands up here at St. Gerardo. This is where the Talamanca mountain range is, that 12,000 feet I was telling you about. It's so high, and because of all the humidity and everything, you're perpetually in a cloud forest. And this is their cloud forest region. So extremely biodiverse kind of place. And then, of course, we came back and had to come back to America, <laughs> to New Jersey. <laughs> so, ecosystem. You've heard of all the temperatures and the rainfall and the equator and the oceans. That comes about, they have 12 different ecosystems in Costa Rica. During our trip, we got to visit six of them. In Tortuguero, our first stop, we were on the Caribbean, so we got the Caribbean coastline ecosystem, and then a mangrove forest. Then we went to Sarapiki, which was lowland tropical rainforest. Then we started going up in elevation near Arenal. And that's a semi-deciduous mid-elevation forest. Then we came down to the Pacific Coast, so we got the Pacific coastline. And then finally, up into the clouds of the Talamanca Mountain Range and the cloud forest. So we got to experience six different ecosystems while we were there. So birds. One of the reasons you go to Costa Rica is to see birds. There's a lot of other reasons, but they have 900 bird species. And again, it's something the size of West Virginia. In a 12-day visit, we recorded 158 different species and 126 life birds for Debbie and I. An amazing place. And a lot of these birds we never even heard of. This was actually as, you know when you hear about birding, you hear about people say, your spark bird to get you started in birding? This is our spark place. We were doing a little bit of birding, but we got into eBird and Merlin, and later on we got into iNaturalist. We became naturalists because of Costa Rica. And it also inspired me to get a better camera, because you'll see not, some of my pictures aren't that great. At that time, I had a, a D3000 and only a 300 lens. So then I got some nice pictures, but my love light pictures, you'll see, are not all that great. Now I have a Sony RX10, much better camera. That's so I will disclaimer. get better pictures. <laughs> this disclaimer here. So anyway, these are the categories of birds, and I'm not going to go through them all, but the biggest one we saw were tanagers and seed eaters. We saw about 20 of those in our, during our trip. And these include things like honeycoopers and saltators that, again, I never heard of. Uh, we saw a bunch of herons and ibises. 
There are 50 hummingbird species in Costa Rica. We saw about 12 of them. Uh, we saw 10 flycatchers, 10 vultures and hawks. Uh, a little less than that, we started getting into wobblers. We only saw about nine different wobblers, some of which we see up here, some we don't see up here. Uh, we saw some uh, parrots, parakeets, and macaws. They come in one category. We saw about eight of those. About seven shorebirds and seven wrens and thrushes. And about five in the areas of blackbirds, with orioles included, wood creepers, and finches and sparrows. And then a bunch of other species where there was less than five per species. That's just the birds. <laughs> then you go to the rest of the wildlife. Butterflies. There's 1,500 species of butterflies in Costa Rica. Yeah. We saw many. I got pictures of 10. So I'll show you those pictures. Sloths. I don't know how many folks have ever seen a sloth, but there's two okay. species of sloths. We only saw one, the three-toed sloth. There's a two-toed that we did not see. Monkeys. There are four species of monkeys in Costa Rica. We got to see three. The howler, the spider, and the capuchin. We did not see the squirrel monkey. Other one, crocodilia. We saw two different types of the crocodile species. One, crocodile, and we saw many of these. Really big guys, and I'll show you some pictures of them. And then we saw some caiman, which I had never seen before. Little guys in the, in the Tortuguera area. Not that little, but compared to a crocodile, they're small. <laughs> Iguana, they're two different species, and we saw them both. They have 70 species of lizards. We saw two of them, the basilic, and something called the amoeba, which is a whiptail lizard. We saw some bats, produces bats. We saw some frogs. Sea turtles. There are four different species of sea turtles. We got to see one, really, and that's the green, and we got to see his nesting <coughs> habitat. So that, that was a really cool trip. We did not see the leatherback, the hawk's bill, or the olive ridley. And we saw one river turtle and some wild birds. So lots of wildlife in Costa Rica, and we're going to see it in the next set of slides. So let's start. Start our voyage. And as I said, we got to Tortuguero. We couldn't go all the way. We had to. Oh, no, no. I messed up. Hit the wrong button. <laughs> we had to take our boat ride. And we stopped on the way. And we stopped at a little town called Tortuguero, a little village. We got to see what the folks live like there. And they're just a tiny village. I think maybe only a couple hundred people live there. And then we headed back into the water and went to the Pira Lodge, which is where we said It's a little resort that's sitting right on the uh, canal in Turkey. Area. We got back there, had our dinner, had some drinks at the bar, a little bit of wine, a little bit of beer. And then we were ready to go to sleep, so we got back into our cabin, started going to sleep. And this is what we heard. Oh, it's not working. The voice isn't working. I have a backup. You could just roar. So we're in the middle of the jungle, our first night in the jungle. It's a shame, this, on the other computer, I just hit a button and it makes the noise. <laughs> but uh, we got in the middle of the night, heard this loud noise right outside our door. It did end in about half an hour or so. But we were about to go out in the jungle to try to find what it was. But when we woke up in the morning, we went outside, and we got to see this guy in the tree. That's a howler monkey. He's about three feet tall, about 32 pounds, really long tail, about the same size of tail he has body. And? Well, the sound he makes can be heard up to three miles away. That's how these howlers, excuse me, specifically the noisy males, communicate with their dudes, I mean, their troops. Um, howlers don't move around as much as other monkeys. They eat mostly leaves, and on that diet, they have to sleep a lot to digest, which makes these big makes it easier for the big fellows to uh, survive the heat of Costa Rica. So we saw some other howler monkeys while we were in Tortuguero, but we really saw a neat howler monkey in a place called Mystico down in the Arenal area, and there we saw a mama howler with a little baby on her back. Unfortunately, the tree limbs in front of his face, but you can see his ears, and he was climbing on the back with Mama. So it was a really interesting little uh, visual. 
So Costa Rica's coastline on the Caribbean Sea is 200 miles long. We were there just to explore 22 miles of that expanse. Our destination was Tortuguera National Park, which can only be accessed by boat, like Bob said. So the water taxi we took was no frills, but the views were first class. There in the distance is one of Costa Rica's extinct volcanoes. And across the, the lagoon on the narrow pen peninsula is that tiny village Bob talked about. It's only two-tenths of a mile long. Then there was the lush uh, foliage draped over the canals that we would explore in the next couple of days. And then the Caribbean was just steps away. And for some of us, all that anticipation required a little nap. <laughs> Hiking's not the way to explore Tortuguera. In quiet electric power boats, we glided down the uh, waterways with our 13 road scholar buddies and our two local guides, Jimmy and Jose. Uh, yeah, Jose, yeah. So, as you can see, we ventured out on several of these canal safaris exploring the park's network of canals, rivers, lagoons, and dense rainforest. We watched, and we listened. Spider monkeys. They say that those screeches and barks and the shaking of branches demonstrate their fearlessness. Here in Tortuguera and Carrera National and in the Arenal region near the Tocolas River, we marveled at the acrobatic antics of these rambunctious critters. Spider monkeys weigh about 19 pounds and they're 21 inches long, but their tails, their strong tails, are about as long as their bodies. So high up in the canopies, they swing and hang upside down, using that long tail as a fifth hand. It said that in Costa Rica there are more monkeys than people. So one of the most common species is this little cutie, the white-faced capuchin monkey. It was fun watching it, nimbly nab nabbing the leaves and tasting morsels from the trees. We hope we have another video. We went to the wrong slide. There you go. Bob's got his little camera there. There you go. So capuchins range from 13 to 22 inches long, and they weigh 3 to 9 pounds. And they live in groups of 5 to 24 animals. 24. And these guys are pretty adorable. But don't let the cuteness fool you. They can be aggressive. And they're pretty efficient hunters. But you see this guy feasting on leaves and bugs. But if they were working in tandem, they could actually take down squirrels and other small mammals. So the next kind of wildlife we saw was a free-toed sloth. And that's the guy on my shirt. The, the guy you see here in, in slide, these two, slide two and slide three, these guys we saw in Tortuguero. These two guys we saw on our way out at Sarapiqui, our next stop. But this is a three-toed sloth. If you look closely, you can see he's got three fingers on his front forearm. forearm. That's what makes him three-toed instead of two. Even though it's the same. Even though it's the same. <laughs> he's about two and a half feet, weighs about 15 pounds, and he is very, very slow. He moves about 0.15 miles per hour. One of the comments that our guides told us you don't have to worry about taking a picture. He'll be there. Go have some lunch, come back out. He ain't going anywhere. As you can tell, they live high in the treetops. So all my pictures, they're hanging off of tree branches. They're herbivores, so they mostly eat leaves and twigs and buds. And you would think that an animal this side would need more, but his metabolism is so slow that he can live on very little food. That's why he moves so slow. Next we're iguanas. Now this I actually used iNaturalist. I had some pictures of iguanas and I didn't know exactly what they were species-wise. So I put them into the computer later, just the last couple of weeks, and found out what I was looking at. I knew they were iguanas, I didn't know what kind they were. So iNaturalist came in very handy for this uh, talk, by the way. So I had, in Tortuguero, we saw green iguanas. This guy, this guy are green iguanas. They're not necessarily green. They have a bunch of different variants of morphs. They could be green, 
blue, black, orange, and even cream color like this guy. They're about five to six feet long when you put his tail out and all the way. Later on in the trip, when we got out to the uh, Herrera National Park that I was telling you about, closer to the Pacific Coast, we saw one climbing a tree, but he was not a green iguana, he was a black spiny-tailed iguana. And he was just slowly climbing up the tree. And we also saw one in the parking lot at that same park, over here, right next to the, I don't know where he, I know he was looking in there for something, but he was sitting right there. And then later on at Hacienda Peru, we saw one just kind of sitting on top of a log. And we saw a bunch of them. These are just my best pictures. Then lizards. Some of lizard species, we only got to see two. But these guys are pretty special. These basilic lizards are pretty special. We saw the green basilic at Tortuguera. This guy is extremely fast. If you can see his feet here, he's got really cool web feet. Because of that, he can sprint very quickly over water. For that reason, he's known as the Jesus Lizard. That's his nickname. He can actually he can walk go upright, upright. He goes upright across the water. Really, and he's about two feet long when you count that big long tail he's got back here. We also saw some common basilics and a brown basilic at some of the interior parts. Again, around Arenal and now closer to the Pacific Ocean. And then I saw this guy, a Middle American amoeba, and this is one where uh, iNaturalist really helped me out. I thought I had a picture of a small caiman, a baby caiman, because he looks a lot like the caiman that I saw. But in fact, it's an, a middle American amoeba, a Central American whip tail. And if you could see his tail, but you can't in this picture, it's green. So it's kind of cool looking. He's not a very big lizard. He's only about like five or six inches. Then we saw some frogs. We saw poison dart frogs in Terrera. Again, hit the wrong button. There goes a, uh, a green and black poison dart frog, and then a strawberry uh, dart frog. And then we saw this guy, a brilliant forest frog. And this was in the uh, Mystico, in the Arenal area. So these potently dangerous frogs are tiny, but bigger threats were lurking. The caiman belongs to the same family as the American alligator, and they're more distantly related to crocodiles. They're not as huge as crocs, but they're still pretty daunting, 19 feet long and up to 600 pounds. Their snouts are U-shaped compared to the crocs, which is V-shaped. These spectacle caimans inhabit much smaller fresh waters of the jungle streams and the swamps because unlike crocodiles, they are unable to process the salty waters that flow down to the oceans. So, Tortuguera National Park is now, these the pictures before I want to point out. These I had to get from Tortuguera National Park website, the actual turtles, because it was dark and I could get no pictures. But this is what we saw on the beach. Continue. And that's one of the reasons we traveled here, because uh, we knew that Tortuguera National Park was the largest, is the largest green turtle nesting site in the Western Hemisphere. And it's where the majority of all Caribbean green sea turtles come from. Thousands of these endangered sea turtles, some 30,000 each season, emerge from the Caribbean under the light of a full moon to lay eggs on Costa Rica's beaches. So after sunset, we gathered on the nationally protected black sands of the Caribbean. We had a conservation guide with us to lead us to the nesting sites. And you'll notice that we, or maybe you can't see, but we had our headlamps covered with the, the red film, so not to disturb. So, on our watch, and to our amazement, a busy mom finished deposit depositing her clutch of somewhere between 80 to 150 eggs in her nest. The nest can be 14 to 24 inches deep. When the laying's done, she uses her powerful back flippers, flailing sand everywhere, covering the eggs and backfilling the nest. Then finish that work, she goes to the sea to rest. She returns to the same site every two weeks to repeat the process. In one season, she could leave as many as eight nests. And when her work is complete, she lumbers back to the Caribbean, leaving only her tracks, and she'll return three to five years later. So it takes the eggs two months to hatch, and then the hatchlings, without help from their mom, they'll emerge and they'll make their way to the sea. 
and they're so cute, but they do eventually grow to about three to four feet, and they weigh three to 350 pounds. And the beach was full of these tracks that we saw, of all the fellows that had been there. Mm. So now birds, we finally got the birds. <laughs> this, is our, this is our first new bird, a bare-throated heron. I've never seen this before. This is the juvenile. Uh, this is the juvenile with the speckled, the brown, dark brown, and light brown back with the white underneath. And a nice looking huge beak here, like some of our herons that you've seen. This is the adult when he grows up, he turns grayish blue. Again, very long beak. Unfortunately, he's kind of hiding a little, he's a little, I think he's a little scared of us. Then we saw some birds that we've seen of before, like an Anahinga, just resting on a tree by the side of the river, and a little blue heron. And this is the first time that we had seen green ibis. We've seen white ibis and glossy ibis, but I've never seen a green ibis before. Then we saw a couple little wading birds, the sun green, which our guide was really happy to see because they're not that easy to find down there. It is not a grebe, it's its own species because he does not dive like a grebe dove. That's what they tell me anyway. I have a little uh, Costa Rica bird book if anybody wants to see it. And then I saw a northern jacan, another small wading bird on the side of the river. He's only about nine inches. And in the town, I told you we went to visit town, we saw three different types of flycatchers. Social flycatchers hanging on the wire, and they're always found in pairs, I'm told. A great kiskadee, which is a really cool looking flycatcher with the yellow, yellow breast, brown wings, and a, and a black and white cap here. And then a tropical kingbird. And then just outside of town, a really nice looking bird called the white collared mannequin. It has the yellow body, the black wings, and the really white neck. And then the most amazing bird that we found there was the Montezuma oropindola. It's a huge bird, about 18 inches, all black except for a yellow tail, and an orange beak, and a big stripe underneath his eye. I have a close up where he was peeking behind the branch and you can see his face a little better with the uh, eye patch here. Mm -hmm. And so? So, this is one of the fascinating birds, but I found them fascinating not because of the size of his color, but because of the nest. So uh, as we motored down the waterway, we spotted what appeared to be woven sacks hanging from tree branches, maybe hanging down three to four feet. Um, these were the nests. So we were too far away to photograph them, so we borrowed this image from Wikipedia. It shows a large colony of oropendula nests. The females weave these long, deep-shaped ovals, and it's guessed that they're created like that to protect the young from falling out and to prevent the eggs from falling out of the nest in heavy winds, because they're often found on the sides of, of waterways. But the male, he's the real swinger. Oropendola are polygamous breeders, meaning that one male mates with many females. And the dominant oropendola will father most of the young in a colony that can have over a hundred nests. Okay, so we're finally ready to leave Tortuguera. So we get on our boat, leave, go west toward a place called Sarapigui, which again is right on the Sarapigui River in a region called Chilamate, and we stayed at the Selva Verde Lodge in, in uh, Sarapipi. So here we'll talk about some of the commerce in Costa Rica that's a little different than just pure nature. And so communities and local economies are pillars of Costa Rica's harmonious lifestyle. Here in the Sarapipi region, we met entrepreneurs and toured small family-run businesses. And we learned about a few of the exported crops that yeah. helped sustain the region's... I've been going sideways. <laughs> region's economy. Do people do? Oh no. Okay, well, <laughs> go back. This, back on my other computer, I just pushed a button and it came on. <laughs> this computer doesn't do that. <laughs> okay, so what you're going to be seeing if it works is. Don't the selfie stuff while I'm getting this uh, You're meeting entrepreneur Maria Lutz Jimenez, whose business is focusing on a delicacy called Hearts of Palm. She's using her machete to peel away the stem until she reaches the heart or the edible inner part of the peach palm. In the 1990s, Costa Rica was the leading exporter, but Hard Times put some operations out of business. It actually was cheaper to grow them in Ecuador. 
So Maria found a winning strategy. In addition to giving tours, she established a restaurant, and she also created a menu that highlights her product. Uh, so we had a chance to sample Heart of Palm Flan, and let's see if I can say this, Cura, Curiadas, their pancakes, or ceviche, and a lot of other really delicious treats. And today, with the growing demand for gluten-free options, Costa Rica's Hearts of Palms are again in demand. We also visited coffee farms. This one we visited is Brit, one of the largest coffee companies. But most of the Costa Rica's coffee production is done on small farms. And it uses sustain they use sustainable practices and they harvest by hand. You know, some countries like to promote their wine regions, but in Costa Rica, it's about the coffee. There are eight distinct regions, all situated in mountain elevations, uh, 2,600 to 3,200 feet. And it's the volcanic soils and the different climates and humidity levels that makes the variation in this uh, in this brands. And there's also a law that pro prohibits growing low quality coffee beans. So in Costa Rica, coffees are made only from 100% Arabica beans. So from coffee to cocoa, who needs wine? Cocoa was one of those of one of the country's major exports before the introduction of coffee. Um, but then a, a, a fungus blight wiped out some of the farms, a lot of the farms. But the enterprising farmers realized that tours of their small cacao plantations would interest visitors. And they were correct. We strolled the farm, marveling at the remarkable cacao trees. The flowers and the pods grow directly on the massive trunks. So while we were there, we learned about harvesting the pods and watched a demonstration of the process involved in making cocoa. And sample, but there's no video of us licking our fingers. <laughs> And this last one is a banana tree. So protective blue materials uh, coat the uh, bunches of, of branches hanging from wires as they're transported to an on-site processing facility. Banana plantations in Costa Rica total more than 100,000 acres. Many of the plantations are operated by companies like Dole, but there's now an effort to grow bananas in rainforests. The project is called Bananas Growing in a Forest. <laughs> where no pesticides or chemicals are applied, yet the pests remain at bay. And they're finding that the banana's best defense is just simply that natural environment. Now, we are finished eating and sampling, and we're looking for thrills, no spills. The whitewater adventures on the Serapique River, and we survived the smallish dips and splashes, but all bets were off as we headed into the class three rapids. But no worries, our team paddled quite adeptly through it with Bob at our helm. We were soggy but successful. And our reward was macheted, fresh sliced pineapple. And it was fun. So the birds from the Sarapique Riviera. One of the nice things that this was not a birding trip we were on, but our two guys were birders. And so every morning, if you wanted to go birding at 6.30, you met outside before breakfast and you'd go on about an hour bird walk in the area and then you'd go have your breakfast. These, this particular lodge, we went on and put out some uh, feeders for the birds and there they don't use seeds, they use bananas and things like that. And what we saw first was a scarlet rumped tanager, again a light bird for me. Uh, a, scarlet, a scarlet in the back and an all black tanager, that's the male. This is the female up here in the tree right next to him. Then we saw a blue-gray tanager, again feeding off the same or similar feeder in the area. And something called a buff-throated saltator, which again is in the tanager seed eater family. I didn't realize all these things. I didn't even know where a saltator was until I saw this guy. And then we had a black cow oriole. I also have Baltimore orioles, but you've seen them here, so I didn't bother taking a picture of them. But it's mostly black with a little bit of yellow on them. Then we saw something at another feeder eating some melons called a banana creeper. This guy here and this red-legged honey creeper were on the same feeder, basically. Again, these are members of the seed eater family. And then we saw a buff rump wobble. I guess this is their version of our yellow rump. You can see a little bit of buff coloring on his rump. And then high in the trees, we saw a black crown and a masked tatira. These used to be in the flycatcher family, but now they're their own separate designations. 
But you, this guy has a little black mask on him. He's mostly all white. This guy has a, a brownish mask with uh, black, black wings and a white body. And then we saw the bird that everybody comes down there to see, the trogon. This is the bird you look for when you're in Costa Rica. And actually, he actually migrates to the U.S. because we had a chance to see him in Arizona, but we couldn't find him. Uh, but a salty-tailed trogon. This is a magnificent bird. He's about 12 inches. Extremely bright red breast. Really cool looking orange beak with pink, pinkish type eyes. And if you look at the back, he has emerald, emerald wings in the back. Really, really cool looking bird. And there's, they're all over the place down there. Not all over the place. We've seen, we've seen a couple of them. Oh, I think I'm wondering what you're looking at. <laughs> well, look hard. You'll see reddish brown ants carrying bright green snippets. And they're marching across our tra hiking trail. This first encounter amazed us. The line of ants just seemed endless, and we learned that it could stretch a mile or more. The ants, with their powerful jaws that vibrate a hundred, sorry, a thousand times a second, hard to believe, were taking these leaf bits back to their underground colony. The leaf bits are not their food source. They compost the pieces of, of leaf and grow a fungus. And it's very interesting, the fungus is the ant's only food source and it can't survive or reproduce outside of the leaf cutter ant nest. Each ant colony is home to as many as three million ants. The nest can grow to be about 100 feet in diameter and covers more than 6,000 square feet. And the ants can carry 20 times their body weight. They're not aggressive, but their bite could draw blood. We definitely wanted to step lightly as we observe this natural phenomenon. Anyway, we left, we left Sarapiki and we went west. We went from a little town called Fortuna and, and wound up in the town in the, right at the base of Mount Arano. We were at a hotel called Arano Carrizo Resort and we were looking out the window at Mount Arano, this higher elevation. Arano National Park covers almost 30,000 acres. And the big attraction, of course, is the sleeping volcano Aranol. It rises 5,000 feet over the landscape. The last eruption was in 1968, after sleeping for more than 400 years. And that explosion buried a five square mile area with rocks, lava, and ash. And renewal came slowly. But a new town finally, eventually, La Fortuna, grew from the ashes and became the gateway to the national park. At the base of the volcano, there's a lake, Arano Lake, and it provides both recreational activity and 12% of the country's hydroelectricity. And nearby in preserved forest in Arano was Bob's chance to be a captain monkey. We got to hike over suspension bridges. There are five or six of them in, on the row, uh, depending on what hike you take. And ours was a three-hour walk through this lush canopy. Yes, there were birds, I'll tell you. Uh, and this beautiful view was from our front porch on our eco lodge. Mm -hmm. We were so fortunate to have cloudless skies, and you could, we could actually see the smoke plumes coming from one of the vents that was still spouting a little bit. But we're not worried. They say that Arenal is in an indefinite resting phase, which allows visitors to enjoy that beautiful landscape and take advantage of the hot springs that have been the real relaxing oasis at many of the lodges in the area. Including ours. Yeah. <laughs> we did go with the hot springs. <laughs> so, right outside our door, right outside the tree, we saw our first, well not, not truly, but we saw a toucan. Our yellow-throated toucan. He used to be called the black mandible toucan, but they changed his name to yellow-throated. You see he's got the yellow uh, beak and he's got something in his mouth that he's eating. We also saw a keelbill toucan back in Tortuguera. I didn't show him there because I wouldn't put him side by side with the yellow furry. You see he's got a green beak and an orange mark on his face, and he also has some yellow here. They're pretty noisy too. And then we saw some red lord parrots. You can see red on the edge of their uh, wings. They were flying by, and one of them happened to land on a tree next to us. So we got a reasonable picture of them. Then we went to Mystico Bridge Hanging, uh, hanging Bridge Trail. We got to see another trogon, and this is a black throated trogon. This one's got the gorgeous yellow body with the all-black head, the yellowish beak, again, the big eyes, but they aren't pink. They look a 
you know, the architecture flashing. Flashing. <laughs> and then we saw our first matma. Never heard of a matma in my life. And I ran across a matma. He's about 18 inches. A really cool looking, a re nice looking blue tail here. It's, uh, I don't know what you call it when it comes down to a little boy and then feathers back out. He's got a black body, a rust head, and black markings on his face. Again, very different, a very gorgeous looking bird. Then we called, and then we had a trip, as we said, at Arano. We went on a trail right near the volcano. And one of the things we ran across is a very kind of ugly looking bird. This is a, uh, he comes to about 36 inches. He's like a chicken. He's in the chicken family, I guess. And he's got the beak here. He can fly, but only in danger. So he'll fly up into the trees when something bothers him, but mostly he stays on the ground. And then his relative, the crested guan down here, he lives high in the trees, and he only comes down to the ground when he's in danger. So they're kind of opposite, but they're, they're related in the, in the uh, Kurosawa guan family. Told you there were birds. <laughs> and then we saw a bird that wasn't very colorful, a clay-colored thrush. It's their version of a robin. This is kind of, uh, basically, this is their robin. They make a nice sound, and you see them in many, many places. Then we had a black-cheeked woodpecker. A striped-breasted wren, you can see the black and white stripes on his neck. And then we saw a really cool gold, golden-headed tanager. And I've never seen one before or after. And I also saw a summer tanager, which I do see sometimes in my backyard up here. Maybe that's the same guy migrating down. And then we saw, again, in Mystico Hanging Bridge, we saw some crested owls. And I got a, not a very good picture of them. He's, they're both hiding in a tree. You can see the crest on them. So I put a better picture of them that I borrowed from American Bird for some reason. <laughs> but they're cool looking owls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we left Arano. We started heading south. We went down toward the Tarcolis River, which was a very, very interesting boat ride. But before we got there, we stopped at a little place called Esparza, which was our lunch stop, and it had a, a mini preserve. And I'll show you some of the birds we saw there. Very, very colorful birds. And after, after we left Tarcolis, we went to our hotel, which was right on the beach at a place called Ponte Leona. So it was right on the Pacific Ocean. And we also, during this trip, visited Carrera National Park, which is right here. So what did we see? Another really cool looking bird. This, I mean, I've never, never heard of a euphonia before, but this is a tawny cap euphonia, yellow body, black wings, and a rusty cap. We did see a black and wobbler, some that I've seen up here, and they migrate up this way. A silky-throated tanager, they're not a great picture of them, but hiding in the branches. And then a rufous snake wren. I guess he's got kind of like some of the markings that you see on the uh, Carolina wren. That's, that's called a rufous snake wren. Then some more birds. <laughs> a blue dacnus. And a honey creeper with a, a gorgeous turquoise body with a black mask and a yellow beak. And you can see they're both eating seeds, so I guess they were having lunch. And that's why they're in the seed eater family, right? And this is a nice green bird. And down here we have a street beak oriole. Again, very different looking than ours. All yellow with black wings and a black face mask. And just outside the place where we ate, we saw a white hawk. And I, I've never seen a white hawk before. Mostly white body, a little bit of black on the bottom of his wings, and a little black uh, eye mask here. A Hoffman woodpecker, which is kind of like our red belly, but a dot is on top of his head instead of on the back. Another saltator, this is a gray saltator. And then a rufous-tailed jackamar. This guy's like an overgrown hummingbird. He's about six or seven inches, maybe up to eight inches, and he's got a really long beak, just like a hummingbird would have. And then we got to the Tarcolis River. We got to see our crocodiles. These guys are huge. They're about 25 feet and 2,000 pounds. This guy was about all of 25 feet, maybe 20 feet swimming in the water. We saw a couple of them on the side of the, uh, of the river with their mouths open to cool themselves. And then this guy got within about two feet of our boat. Now we're a little elevator fan, so we weren't too nervous. If you see his little beady eyes, and you can see he doesn't have the overbite like the uh, caiman did. That's a bottom tooth coming upwards. Uh, they live, can live in either fresh or salty water. The Tacolos River is a, is a brackish water. Well, I, I have to admit that I wasn't feeling so brave when we had this cross eye view of the Tacolos River. Um, and maybe I should have opted for the other way to view them. There is the Crocodile Bridge. It's a definite tourist hot spot. 
You just park on the road and look down, but don't drop the puppy. <laughs> there's, there's at least two, three dozen of these we saw on the river. They're all over the place. Well, it says that the Tercolis has one of the highest populations of crocodiles in the entire world. And it's 25 crocodiles per square kilometer. So, again, lots of amazing birds. And this, I thought, was a really cool looking black hawk. I always know the black hawks from the Chicago black hawks, but this is a black hawk. He's about 18 to 20 inches, solid black with a little yellow beak. And then we saw these things called groove-billed annie, another light bird. These are in the cuckoo family. You see his little gray beak here? And then we got to see two different caracaras, a crested caracara and a yellow-headed caracara. These guys were on the side of the river. They like to hang around agricultural areas, and they were farms, as you can tell. And sometimes they even get on the back of the cows and eat the ticks off the back of the cows. That's how they feed themselves. These guys are around 18 to 20 inches, and they're in the falcon family. And the yellow-headed caracara is known as a dietary opportunist, which means they'll feed on pretty much anything. Carrion, roadkill, garbage. Um, they can fly, but they prefer to hunt on the ground. And they have been known to pirate food from other scavengers, such as vultures. Well, they'll mob the vulture until the vulture drops the food. Uh, and they're pretty crafty. Where there's grass fires, they'll hang around the edges, and when the other animals are fleeing, fleeing from smoke or flames, they'll run in and pick them up. Not for a ride home. So then we started seeing some other birds along the side of the river, and I thought this guy was, again, pretty cool. He is fairly hard to see in the daytime because he's mostly a nocturnal animal. And during the day, he usually hides in the weeds and bushes, but we got him to come out to the bank of the river in the sand. He's called a double-striped thickening. Okay. He's about 18 inches high. He's got yellow, sometimes greenish or grayish legs, pretty long legs. He's got the black and the white stripe on top of his head, a, ni a nice stout beak, and some really beady looking eyes. Yeah, and you've got to admit, he looks like a, a pretty distinctive reptilian look. But the most prominent feature are these leg joints. So it can fly, but with joints like that, you know he'll be running. We also saw some black neck stilts, which we've seen here in the U.S. We happen to see a couple, of, a few of these down in Florida. Some black belly whistling ducks, which I've actually seen in uh, Forsyth. And there was a fly, there was a number of these. There was like two or three groups of, uh, I don't know what they call them, ducks, but groups of, uh, of these on the river. And then a wimble with a long beak hanging out. Then, a roseate spoonbill. Again, we saw them in Florida. He's, he's having some lunch trying to catch something here. But he was uh, right along the banks of the river. And then I was lucky enough to get a picture of a mangrove swallow. He was flying right alongside our boat. And he was flying about the right speed as our boat. So I could get a decent picture of him. He's black wings and black body with white in the back of his body. Then we saw another motmot. This one is a turquoise brow motmot. A little bit different tail, turquoise tail. He was only about 13 inches. We saw, we saw belted kingfishers and some others, but we also saw an Amazon kingfisher. He's got a green body with a white neck, and unfortunately you can't see his beak behind the limb. He was sitting right in, in, in a bunch of weeds in the uh, side. And then a different kind of a heron, a boat billed heron. Again, things I had never seen. Out of this slide, I saw a spoon bill, but I did not see the other four, so they were all light birds for us. He's got a nice wide bill. Can't see his face as good because there's a piece of a limb hanging in front of his face, but he looks different than most of the herons that I've seen. He's, he's fat and spudgy. These are the kind of herons I'm used to seeing, and we saw quite a few of those. Green heron, tricolored heron. We have two different yellow crowned light herons on a, on a stump in the middle of the river. And then the little blue heron, and I did not know the little blue herons were white when they were born. They turned blue later on, but this guy's all white and he's an immature. And then a wood stork. And again, we've seen him a couple different places in the U.S. But really nice to see them hanging on the side of the river. And then we're back to seeing another bare-throated heron. I showed him in the first picture. This guy, you can actually see his beak and the yellow on his neck. Just sitting in a bunch of uh, stuff on the side of the river. Snowy egret, a spotted sandpiper, and then something we're very familiar with, a great blue heron. So they have some of the same birds we do. And then some white ibises with a yellow crown night heron. So our guy thought we had bad eyes. He kept pointing and we weren't sure what we were looking at. So we're looking at these long nose or proboscis bats. Focusing in, we looked 
at this, and I thought of the honey locust tree with the big thorns on it. So that's what they look like to me, big thorns. But these were sleeping bats. They line up one after another on a branch, trunk, wooden beam. They go nose to tail in some kind of a row. Their names refer to the fleshy, long, pointy noses that they have. They're kind of small, only two and a half inches. And we found these in several habitats in the mangrove forests of the Mystico Hanging Bridge in Tortuguera. It was easier to see this river turtle in the Sarapiki. And on our boat ride, we got to see these wild horses just grazing on the riverside on their grasses. Well, Costa Rica has gorgeous butterflies. And we were busy spotting birds, but we couldn't help chasing butterflies too. And Bob did get some decent shots of 10 out of the 1,500. So um, we had lots of opportunities to see these Costa Rica, Costa Rica butterflies. We looked at butterfly enclosures, pollinator gardens, and in the wild. There was one, though, you'll know the song that keeps playing in our heads, the elusive butterfly. Not because he was hiding, but because he would never open up. So once you see the beautiful color of his open wings, of this blue morpho, you will understand why we waited and watched for one to settle down and spread his wings. Here in the Arenal, near those Mystico hanging bridges, Bob got and this pretty morpho posed for him. So the number of butterflies here, I won't go into detail, but most of these I identified on iNaturalist when I finally got a chance to see what they were. The only one that's still in doubt is this guy here called the Sindo Longwin. They're still debating back and forth as to what it is. All the other guys got confirmed. This is called a Ipicola sister, owl butterfly, a red postman, some other long wings, and a banded peacock. So, all kinds of butterflies. Okay, so now we're leaving Punta Leona, and we're getting near the end of the trip, so we're getting close here, guys. Uh, oops, let's just move one button. We go, down the, we go down the coast to a place called Hacienda Baru, right here on the uh, Pacific Ocean. Spend some lunch there and visit his preserve, and have a walk with the guys. And then we go head up to the mountains at Savegre Hotel Nature Reserve. And this is at that 12,000 feet and where the cloud forest was at. But first we visit Hacienda Baru. So, before we left for the trip, I bought this book, Monkeys Are Made of Chocolate, and it was written by Jack Ewing that you see here. It was a great pleasure to meet him and to hear his story, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. He came from Colorado to Costa Rica more than 50 years ago. He was going to raise some cattle and grow rice on an existing piece of... Uh, He's one of the guys that cut, cut down all the trees back down in California. He did. Somebody did. Somebody else did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it was, uh, the farm was carved right out of coastal rainforest on the Pacific Ocean. So it didn't take him too long to realize that this wasn't right. Um, when I was reading the book, I understand how he came to that decision because he talks about so many of the people that he met and so many um, anecdotes. You have to get this, it's at Amazon, and he wrote a second one. Um, it, it's, it's amusing and heartbreaking, um, but it, it really does give a picture of why he realized that cattle was not the right you know, crop, and in fact, nothing was the right crop. crop. He decided that he would create the Hacienda Baru National Wildlife Refuge from this deforested track. It took years, decades actually, and now it's revived, and it's a refuge, and it's 815 acres, and it contains tropical rainforests, mangroves, wetlands, riverbank, and beachfront. And with that wide variety of ecosystems, it means a high level of biodiversity. And then Jack also established a small eco-lodge for birders and nature lovers. As we roamed this backyard, beautiful, um, we found this interesting tree, a calabash tree. Um, just one of the great specimens that were in the area. So the fruits are gourd-like ovals, and they're about 20 inches in diameter, and they're very hard shell. And they're used for containers and bowls and cups and even musical instruments. Now, although the flesh and uncooked seeds are said to be poisonous, the leaves and fruit have medicinal properties if prepared properly. And Jack's still involved, and he did talk to us a little bit about uh, his attempts with others to create wildlife corridors. So those corridors connect these uh, refuges and wild preserves to give large animals like the jaguar and the tapir 
uh, space they need to roam around and sort of survive. It was a fascinating stop. I wish we could have spent more time there. And I told Bob, we, I did see that the Eco Lodge was for sale. <laughs> so, there are 35,000 known species of insects in Costa Rica, and that's just a fraction of the 300,000 estimated species. This one we spotted was really unique. I don't know whose eyes got on this first, but what a, what a find. They're called leaf-footed or flag-footed bugs. You'll see on the back legs, they have wing-like structures. You're actually looking at what you think is three bugs at first. So those, those wing-like structures are on the tibia of the hind legs. They're classified as true bugs. So they're called true bugs, um, and they're in the same category as our stink bugs and squash bugs and cicadas and so many other bugs. And that classification means they're able to pierce through leaves and suck out the nutrients. And in Costa Rica, you often find them on the passion flower vine. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. okay, well, you can see that Bob was enjoying the Pacific coast, but there were mountains to climb. He likes them too. So, well, we traveled to these mountains. We're heading up into the mists. And these are the Talamanca Mountains, and they are the 12,500 foot uh, peaks that uh, are just gorgeous. We hiked one of the trails, well without too much elevation. And uh, we stopped for bird watching and for pretty gurgling creeks. It was just so green and so exhilarating and exhausting. Mm -hmm. So you have a happy hiker here, and the video you're seeing is an overlook in the Sagrada Cloud Forest. And we sat there in the hush, rising and falling this shroud, all the abundance and diversity and the beautiful treasures of this cloud forest. So what kind of birds did we find? <laughs> First I want to tell you about the birds that I saw at the beach, because I really didn't want to leave the beach. <laughs> we saw these scarlet macaws. They were hanging in the trees in a little wooded area next to our hotel. And there was a bunch of them, and I got a really good picture of these guys. These are an endangered species. And they're about two and a half to three feet long, and they hang very high in trees. I also had a great green macaw. I didn't get a very good picture of him. That was back in Tortuguera. You can see the blue wings and the, uh, the red tail, but he was flying high above. So this is what we saw at the beach area. Then we went into the highlands, and we saw sulfur-winged parakeets. Greenish parakeets with a yellow face with a little bit of red on there. These are only found at the high elevation. And we saw what I thought was a really exquisite looking flycatcher. This is called a long-tailed silky flycatcher. And he was sitting in a bush just outside one of our, ca our cabin up at the uh, lodge. And yellow body, a little bit of gray, really cool looking face. And on the trail that Debbie talked about, that pioneer trail that we went on, we got to see some other interesting birds. This is a ruddy tree runner. He's about a six inch bird out of the wood creeper family. And then we saw a couple different uh, sparrows. We saw a rufous colored sparrow. You see a little bit of uh, rufous on, uh, rust on this collar here. And then we saw something called a sooty cat chloros pingus. You can barely pronounce it, let alone know what it was. You never heard of it. Olive body, a little bit less olive here, and a black and white stripes on his head with a tiny little beak. Then we saw a member of the wobbler family, a collared red start. I've seen American red starts here, but this is the first time I've seen a collared red start. And then a flame-colored tanager. Again, not a great picture, but you can see the bright orange-red face with the black and white back in the green color. And then hummingbirds. We get to uh, some of our special birds. We're near the end of the talk now. And so we saw a number of hummingbirds. And I got pictures, nice pictures of about eight or ten of them. These I saw in the lowlands. The next slide, most of them are going to be in the upper, uh, highlands. We did see more in the highlands than we saw in the lowlands. We saw a rufous tailed hummingbird and a bronze tailed plumeteer in the Sarupiki region. And I think this guy that's feeding over here is also one of those. And then I saw a striped throated hermit. We saw a striped throated hermit in Tortuguero area. And then we saw this guy, this scaly breasted hummingbird, just outside our cabin in Arana. You can see this is the porch of our cabin. And he was just, uh, just outside of that. 
And about this time, I wish I knew a botanist to travel with Carl, because I would have loved to know what some of the flowers are. Some of them look obvious. I did get a chance to look up this purple one, and I think it's a called a mouse tail, and it's a species of verbene, which grows wild in Costa Rica, and you can see the hummers love it. So here, again, some magnificent looking uh, hummingbirds. First I'll start with the bronzy hermit, because he was in Sarapiki, the lowland area. A bronze hummingbird with a black cap and black mask around his eyes. The rest of these are all high elevation birds. You can see this one's called a purple throated mountain gem. I got a really close up picture of him. I'm not exactly sure what he's eating, but he was eating something in the tree. And then I have a white throated mountain gem and another white throated mountain gem over here. Again, really interesting looking hummingbirds. A Talamaca hummingbird named after the mountains and a volcano hummingbird named after the volcano. <laughs> so these are all the higher elevation hummingbirds. So these are just like a dozen of the hummingbirds that are available. If we were there longer, we probably saw more or we just didn't get pictures of them. <laughs> and then finally, the really cool looking bird, our resplendent pretzel. Wait, wait, I, I need to show this avocado tree. This is a wild avocado tree over here. Yeah, I know, you're not looking at it, are you? I think something else caught your attention, and it is this beautiful resplendent quetzal, quetzal, they say, up there in the canopy. It's called the Emerald Jewel of the Cloud Forest, and it doesn't have camouflage itself too well. It's got these shimmery feathers, the shades that ring from green and lime and cobalt and ultramarine and has that flamboyant red front, and his crown is almost iridescent. Now during the breeding season, the male will display two t tail feathers, twin tail feathers, and they're two to three feet long. You see them ribboning down between the leaves and the epidites in this tree. And the females don't get those tails, but they're pretty. But back to the wild avocados. They're not like the ones that are cultivated for us. These fruits are just slightly larger than an acorn. And they ripen during the breeding season and are one of the Quetzal's favorite foods. It's kind of neat how, neat how they do it though. They'll take a bunch of them in their mouth, whole, and they'll perch on the branches for 25 minutes. So you wonder why people get gorgeous pictures of this guy. He's sitting there digesting, not moving. So he waits while the acids in his stomach remove the skin and the flesh from the seed, and then look down below because the bird regurgitates the seeds. So a final bird picture. This one I, I find hard to believe, but this is Costa Rica's national bird. He's called Yagura, the clay cluttered thrush. With all those beautifully <laughs> responding colorful birds, they take the most common bird they can find, and that's their national bird. And they voted on this back in the 70s. And the reason they picked them is because of this strong, melodious song that always comes when the start of rainy season. And I don't think it's going to work there. So. We learn that ecotourism is a point of pride and a way of life. Well, Costa Rica has an expansive riches that they're more than happy to share. And they will always wish you pure Good vida. Good. Uh -huh. Good. Sorry, went a bit long. <laughs> she likes to talk. <laughs> Any questions since we decide we're not experts to just and they, have to they, go there. And the trip, 
there are a lot of folks our age on that trip. It wasn't like it was that hard a trip. It's not hard to do. So it's, do the natives uh, eat those uh, uh, lizards and then the other guys? Uh, we didn't come across that for sure. We didn't see that. They might. They might. You know, there's, there is an indigenous groups of indigenous populations that we weren't, you know, we didn't get to. And it would be interesting to know what their you know, customs and traditions are. And we basically got to see the center of Costa Rica. There's some yeah, stuff in the high, higher end and about the bottom end close to Panama. Yeah, there is a big, and there's, there, there are big groups of expats who live in Costa Rica. Um, that was interesting. Uh, I don't know that. I'm it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting that the east coast of Tortuguero was a jungle. Ponte Leone, where we stayed, it was like condo city, yeah. right along the beach. It looked like you went to Florida. Yeah. The beach is with the condos, and it's all Americans. Yeah, <laughs> so just to figure out the cheap price to retire. It's yeah. not an expensive country, so if you don't mind the and there are different ways of doing things, it's a yeah. nice, nice place to retire. And there are so many tour, tour different tour companies. It's, it's, it's just thriving. Um, one of the problems, of course, they're having is the balance. You know, you bring so many people in. The good thing about it is that there are so many trails, so many beautiful natural places that it, you, know, you don't run into crowds of people. And you know, I think that the whole the whole mindset is like, yeah, you can be here, but tread lightly. So uh, it's it's really good. What month did you go? And we went in October. And why did you choose that? Uh, it met our schedule because we don't like to go in the summertime because there's too many people. So we usually go in the fall, and it's right before the start of this rainy season. So it's actually a good time to go. I think somewhere around uh, right the end of the I'm sorry, the end of the rainy season. The summertime is rainy, and then it's kind of dry. And it was so also we right? actually did pretty good. We got rain one day while we were there. It was it was just towards the end of this the. Uh, Bring sea turtles nesting at time. So right. that the sea turtles stop in, in yeah. at October, November. After that, they're done. Yeah. So you wouldn't see that nesting thing happen. Yeah. Did you get to see many of those great big turtles? We saw a lot of the big turtles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we didn't see the others. The others come in different times of year. So it depends on yeah. when you go as to which turtles you see. But those green turtles were all over the beach. We didn't get to see the little babies hatch. That, that's going to happen. Like this was October. They'll hatch sometime in December. But remember, it's always like 80 to 90, so it's not like there's a weather problem here. <laughs> the problem is when they hatch, though, and, and that's really a problem. They, they, they put these nests here, and these little turtles come out of the sand, and they got to scamper to the beach, and they got to get in the water before one of these many birds finds them, because they're tiny. They're little guys, and they're, they're prey for a lot of things. Yeah, and just I'm like sure we, they know. Just like we do with the horseshoe crabs and all, there's a big uh, volunteer and, and a professional scientist um, conservancy down there to monitor. It's, you know, you have to uh, obey the rules of when you can go. You can't go when they're doing the nest. We had to go at night. Um, they don't want the bright flashlights distracting in any of the hatching hatchlings. So um, it really is cool it, watching them dig the holes yeah. and flap their wing, their, yeah. their flippers, and get the yeah. eggs all covered up. It and was you, really amazing. And it's not a place where you swim with them in this Caribbean. It actually, uh, we were told that it drops off sharply. Um, it's kind of interesting. There's no, there are no seashells on this uh, Caribbean shore. There are no mangroves. So it's just this wild ocean coming in. And you've got to think about these, the lives of these poor tur mama turtles, especially. Um, so it, it's, it's not like Hawaii where you can walk out and just swim with the big sea turtles. Any other questions? Well, go. It's great. <laughs>